Uh, I've been in the 3D industry probably about 15, 16 years now. Um, I've done commercials, films, AR, VR, games, um, back to short films again. So kind of um, if it's 3D, I've, I've been around it or done it. Um, I'm a principal art director for the Fuzzy Pixel team on uh, our Fuzzy Pixel uh, is a creative team within AWS. Um, and we did the short uh, using Nimble Studio, like you mentioned, and Blender. Um, we're a group of industry vets. Uh, we come from kind of all over the industry. Uh, and our mission is to use our products and services uh, as our customers would. Um, so we're doing real world productions. We're creating uh, highest end content that we can possibly create uh, to really battle test all of our services and make the, sure that they're ready for creatives uh, when everything goes live. Uh, and we're kind of referred to as a, a customer zero. Uh, we hit, hit the everything first and make sure it's ready for you when, uh, when it comes out. Uh, so our Fuzzy Pixel team, um, we've produced uh, four shorts to date. Uh, we did Spanner back in 2020. Uh, we did a couple of very short shorts, uh, Shockingly Fluffy and Getting Fuzzy in 2021, just to kind of wrap our heads around Blender uh, in preparation for our bigger short, Pichu, which we put out this year in 2022. Um, this is uh, our main character, Mayu, um, and our uh, splash art for Pichu. Uh, and then I uh, just wanted to share something from our director, Amaru Zayas, uh, about the story of Pichu. Uh, so this is from Amaru. He says, uh, my mom is a big influence in my life. She taught me the importance of using my work to contribute to society and that technology can be used with a purpose to create and transform. Connecting technology with the heart to tell a story transforms the work, a team involved, its leaders, and the people who watch the story. It moves us to act in our reality and that transforms us as people. The concept of Peachy was a story that I had already been working on since the end of 2020. While writing the story, I came to the cruel realization that Ecuador is not the only country that struggles with children's education. It's a global problem. I wanted to create a story that has a great social impact. Peachy was the story of an Andean girl who will have to face the challenges of life with the support of her mother. With great pride, Peachy was based on the Ecuadorian culture using its beautiful landscapes, clothing, and Andean music. Um, so one of the things that Amaro mentions there is uh, authenticity. And this was really important to us. Um, and one of the things is that we really wanted to ensure, as we were creating Pichu, that we stayed true to the Andean, re Andean region of Ecuador. Um, and it was important that the, the people from Ecuador look at something that we create and say, hey, that's me, that they really feel connected to it. Um, they don't feel like we did. Uh, a poor job of representing them. We really wanted them to be proud. Um, and you'll both see in here how we uh, explore the Ecuadorian culture throughout the architectural environment, clothing, um, and, uh, and the characters. And uh, to that end, um, we got uh, Amaru's mom involved. Uh, she uh, plays one of the characters, Kalpa. She plays the mother in the film. Um, and is what's also our cultural advisor. So um, is it doing anything with art? It all starts with reference. Um, I needed to immerse myself in the cultural aspects of the Indian culture. Uh, I'm looking for, like, it, to back up just a little bit, like I'm a character artist at heart. Uh, that's where I come from. And then we're doing production design for the film. So I always start with character. Um, so I'm looking at skin tones, uh, eye, nose, and mouth shapes. Um, you can notice things in the characters, like they get very sun, windburned cheeks. Uh, and, th and these things are very important to represent in the film. Um, we also got to learn things like uh, there's different ponchos between the boys and the girls. Uh, the girls ends up being more of a blanket that they wrap and pin together, where the boys' poncho is like a whole poncho that's all one contiguous piece. Um, and then hats and belts and all the costuming and things like that. Uh, and to that end, uh, I created a series of 14 speed sculpts, of which you can see a few here. Um, some of them pretty good, some of them kind of crap, to be, <laughs> be perfectly honest. Um, uh, but that's important. Um, it's just try and fail and, until you get it right, basically. Um, so I started off with something more realistic uh, as the top left one there, and then try to push and pull. And you know, by the, the bottom left one there, I had something you know, looking sort of decent, um, but then I really wanted to push it to something more unique, uh, create an own unique style for Pichu, and I ended up by like, pulling her face horizontally, um, created more of a chonky round style where everything's a little bit inflated, a little bit puffy. Uh, there's no hard edges to anything, like you'll see in some of the architectural and things like that later. Uh, and I hear like much larger bevels, slightly exaggerated proportions, 
Um, but we did want to have a material truth. Uh, so like the cloth feels like cloth, skin feels like skin. Um, the eyes use refraction shaders and things like that to pick up the light properly. Um, and then blending the style and realism together uh, to create our own unique look. And this, uh, if I can get it to play, this is a turntable of our characters. Uh, so Mayu there in the red poncho, Kapa the mother, and then uh, her friend Saiwa in the uh, lavender poncho. Finish out. How do I get this to move on? You just, just click to the next slide here. I can't. Can't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, here we go. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> you can also see how uh, in the foliage, these are paper trees. Uh, it's very iconic to the region of Ecuador. Uh, they grow up in the high altitudes. Um, and then how we put a style pass on that. Um, the image on the left uh, is sort of a, a less stylized paper tree where there's lots of little leaves, like it's as many as it will normally have. Um, the leaf colors are more warm tones. Um, and the um, paper tree on the bark is a little more detailed, things like that. But when we put our style pass on it, we removed about half the leaves, inflated them, made them much more puffy. Uh, and then we even pushed the leaves a uh, cooler color. Uh, with the intention, we really wanted to be um, intentional with our use of color throughout the film, uh, where our character Mayu is in bright, vibrant, saturated colors of reds and things like that. Uh, and then we wanted to put her at visual contrast with the environment to make it feel more dangerous as she's moving through her journey. Uh, so we made the environment much more cool in color, um, just to, one, draw your eye to the character, but then, again, like I said, uh, to put her at odds with the environment just visually. And then we went through the architecture as well. You know, everything is rounded bevels. This image on the left is actually uh, a door that Amaro's dad produced. Uh, he made, handmade, because um, he's an architect. So as part of his thesis project, he, he made that. Um, but then we put it through our style pass, so it has no sharp edges. Uh, again, we made the colors more cool and desaturated. Uh, but we still have our material truth, so the metal feels like metal, and wood feels like wood. Another example of the house. and then the school where Mayu ends up. And then we also, like I mentioned previously, uh, we wanted even the music and the sound to be authentic uh, to the Ecuadorian culture. So we hired uh, local artists um, and singers. Uh, all the actresses uh, in the film are from Ecuador. Uh, our local musician here, he actually uh, made all these instruments and played them for part of the film. Uh, and he even went out into the wilderness and recorded like the river sounds and sounds of birds and frogs and things like that. So everything we could was as authentic as possible. And then uh, at this point, I'll hand it back to Oleski to talk uh, a little bit about the pipeline and things we use for Nimble. Yeah, thanks. So the, there's the recipe for gave, getting ovation. You just need to pass it over to someone. Um, so as I already mentioned, we made this short completely in the cloud uh, using a managed service from AWS called uh, Nimble Studio. You see it in the top left corner. So it's kind of overarching the whole thing and abstracts the management of the underlying uh, pieces. And these are depicted here. So we used uh, different workstations for the artists. Some of them were running Linux, some of them were running uh, windows for different kind of DCC software that the artists uh, were using. Um, and yeah, I think uh, some of these, Chris, will go into some more detail later on. Uh, we'll, we'll be milking this like ovation thing. Uh, so <laughs> there will be a couple of transition. Um, but um, so before going into more detail on what Nibble Studio is and what it does, uh, let me take a step back and look at a typical pipeline for such a project. Uh, you might have seen this before, and this is an overly simplified version of uh, what's really um, happening on a, on a project. Um, so a movie consists of shots, and you move those through this pipeline, right? So um, you uh, need assets like sets, props, rigged characters, and so on. And these are created in advance. And then every shot goes from layout to animation to character fix, and so on, over to finally to editorial. And um, this is kind of linear, what we show here, but in reality, there are iterations in every step, correct? So 
you want to make it better and better and better, and the cycle repeats many, many times, and the more iterations you put into it, the better kind of quality level you end up with. Um, and this is an important point because the number of iterations that you can make usually depends on uh, kind of capacity that you have uh, in your underlying infrastructure. And um, this is important because like supporting this uh, pipeline is technology. So it's uh, artist workstations, uh, storage, so for assets, uh, asset repository, and render farm. Um, now that we speak about render from, probably all of you know that, but let me just repeat it once again. So rendering is taking geometry, lights, and uh, camera relative locations and giving it to, over to a machine and say, okay, compute what it looks like from the camera perspective. And usually before it looks nice, this process is pretty time intensive. So for many films, it's uh, typical to have render times of a couple hours, sometimes like previously we were talking about days of rendering uh, time per frame, and you'll know there's like 24, or at least 24 frames per second, sometimes more. And of course it doesn't make sense to run it on the same local machine where the artist is working, so we offload it to a render farm. And um, render farms were logically the first component that studios tried moving into the cloud. Uh, because um, it has been one of the most prominent uh, bottlenecks in a studio's infrastructure mix. If we take a typical project, a studio usually starts having a certain pre-allocated server capacity, so over on the left side of the slide before things go wild, um, and then they notice at some point that they run into a bottleneck of not having enough of this capacity. So artists uh, submit jobs, That's, at some point it's too much for the render farm to handle, um, and all available resources are, are consumed, and then artists have to sit around waiting for their renders to come back before they can continue with their job. Um, not very nice situation, and uh, uh, then the studio usually responds by adding some capacity, depending on the duration of a project, you do it several times, and then you uh, yeah, embark on this uh, game of catching up with the needs of the uh, production, adding capacity, and uh, figuring out how to do it at the same time juggling other, other, other tasks that you, that you have. Um, so there are certain inefficiencies to this approach. So anytime the studio um, has too much capacity to fill, uh, this represents the wasted resources. So these light areas where no jobs are submitted to use the capacity that we have in place. Uh, Essentially, this is capacity that you're paying for but not using. And when there is a utilization above capacity, this means the studio is using all their sources, which is good, right? Uh, but this could be a potential bottleneck. So artists are waiting until jobs that, that are kind of going over the capacity uh, will render to continue their work. Now, the situation gets more dramatic if we take a typical real life project. Um, where everything results in a crunch. Um, and <laughs> there can be uh, many reasons for this. Uh, the typical suspects are story being revisited or character designs uh, being altered late in the process. Uh, whatever reasons may be, the result is that a lot of work is delayed and then it all has to be done in very limited time uh, because the deadline is looming and you cannot move it. Uh, so teams try to iterate as many times as possible before the deadline to, to bring that to, to the quality level that they're shooting at. And yeah, so basically it's, it's a very t difficult situation to handle. Um, of course, this was an awesome opportunity uh, for studios to turn to the cloud and use the virtual instances as render worker nodes. Um, this was a huge win uh, because it worked and they began looking for other opportunities to move other infrastructure elements to the cloud too. But curious enough, uh, the studios didn't use cloud render farm quite the way we were expecting or like they were expecting. Um, we assumed that many uh, would just take the peaks of high utilization that we saw in the previous slide closer to the end, uh, not necessarily in the very beginning of the project, and send these extra jobs to the cloud when, when the capacity was no longer enough. Um, and mainly closer to the end of the project, this would be happening. But it turns out that this wasn't the case. Instead, 
Studios spread out their jobs and took advantage of all this excess capacity at all times. Practically, this was resulting in more iterations taking place throughout the whole uh, production process, not only during the crunch time. And yeah, so this results in more iterations, more reviews, more notes, and higher quality overall. Now, let's zoom out a little. Uh, Rendering is not the only part that you can move to the cloud, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, essentially, you can build a studio in the cloud with all the other resources as well. So you can place your artist workstations there. You can place asset repository there. Um, you no longer need beefy workstations in everybody desk. Um, and this can be difficult. We uh, released a, a guide describing how you can build a do-it-yourself studio in the cloud. And this was hundreds of pages. Not everybody has like an army of uh, cloud architects to build and support this. And uh, we thought, and everybody probably thinking, there must be a better way. So, um, and there is a better way. And this is where Amazon Nimble Studio comes in. This is a service that allows you to deploy cloud infrastructure and be up and running in, in a few hours. So you don't have to spend these hundreds of hours or months. Uh, uh, before you can start creating. And it's a service that was created by creatives for creatives. Uh, back when Nimble Collective came up with their idea, they were at uh, DreamWorks and already had a lot of experience in the industry. And throughout their careers as animators and other professionals working in the industry, they saw that many artists were struggling to get their ideas off the ground because bigger studios only invested in limited number of movies, but at the same time, smaller studios couldn't afford the tech necessary uh, to realize their big ideas. Um, and this team's main goal with Nibble Collective was to enable smaller studios with the technology available to bigger studios. And in 2019, AWS acquired Nibble Collective, and we took some time to make the solution well architected and enterprise ready and we relaunched it. Uh, and we, we launched it in 2021 under a new name, Nimble Studio. On a very high level, Nimble Studio provides exactly the building blocks that we were talking about previously um, on a very high level. I'll dive a little bit deeper later. So these are workstations, shared storage for assets and render farm. And important point, it's all in the cloud and, and on a uh, so you don't have to invest upfront uh, before you can start creating. If we zoom in a little, here's what a simplified architecture looks like. Uh, let's take it step by step. So on the project, you will have artists who do modeling, animation, visual effects, compositing, etc., and they need access to powerful workstations, preferably GPU-based uh, for hardware-accelerated graphics. Uh, with Nimble Studio. Admin can define templates saying, okay, uh, this group of artists needs this kind of software and this other group needs something else. And then you just let people spin up uh, uh, the, from these templates, spin up instances based on what they are supposed to be doing in a project. So it's not like everybody has access to everything. And a good thing is that you connect into it using something like Nice DCV or Teradici. So it's high, uh, really bandwidth efficient, and you can use the peripherals that you're used to using, like your Wacom tablet, and um, it will support uh, several uh, high-res monitors, so you are not limited to only one screen, and uh, also some um, specific features on the peripherals that you're, you're using will be also supported with, with this kind of connection. And uh, one note here is that we recommend placing these workstations into the nearest AWS region. I'll show the map later uh, because latency is important. So here you want to make sure that it doesn't exceed 50 milliseconds and for luxury performance like 20 milliseconds. But we have like very uh, a good setup here in Europe with connectivity, so it's, um, it's workable. And uh, the left slide of this architecture diagram shows a mix of infrastructure components that the pipeline depends on. I'll go through them real quick and on a very high level, not to, not to bore you to death, uh, but just so to understand w what it does. So there is storage uh, in the form of just asset storage where your raw uh, original assets are stored. 
but also uh, FSX as a file system, it's cloud-based file system that you can mount uh, on an artist workstation or a render node. A license server for software that needs it to, so you can run it. Uh, Active Directory and SSO are components that uh, allow you to create users and for these users to log in into the solution, into the portal. I will show you what the portal looks like. Uh, Deadline is our render management software, which is free for use on AWS, and the compute represents the actual worker knows that the deadline wins, will spin up when you need to render stuff. And AMIs are the templates that you can create to, yeah, to include all the GCC software that you need, and you can actually customize it with plugins, typical plugins that you would use, and then reuse this customized template over and over for, for all artists who, who need it. So what it looks like for, um, for an artist, let's say we have Carlos, who is a designer on our project. And when Carlos logs into Nimble Studio Portal, he will see one environment that he can work in uh, called design, logically. Um, and to begin working, he will just click launch here. And Nimble Studio will spin up a machine for him with all the tools he needs to do his work. In this case, he's using Blender. Um, who wouldn't? And it's important that Carlos can operate Blender as freely as he would in his, on his local machine. Um, those of you who probably saw our booth at SIGGRAPH or IBC could probably also try what it, what it feels like. You cannot tell the difference between local machine and accessing uh, a cloud-based instance. Uh, like you move the mouse, the cursor responds instantly, so you, you don't feel a difference with the, uh, with the delay that we're, we're talking about, with the latency of 20 to 50 milliseconds. And you can use your Intuos Pro or Cintiq, whatever you're, you're comfortable with. And let's say the artist is happy with their work, and now they want to submit a render, and they can use the integrated deadline submitter. It's, uh, it's a plugin for Blender. And what this will uh, uh, initiate is that um, you, you have a, a queue of render jobs, and uh, it will spin up the workers. These will be so-called EC2 spot instances, the cheapest way to run EC2 instance, like virtual machine instance on AWS. Um, and uh, these will only be spun up when there are jobs, uh, so they will not be running at all times. And then after the tasks are finished, they will be also brought down automatically by the deadline. Important point is that instances are only used and launched based on what is in the queue. Uh, so it means that you only have a render farm when there is stuff to render. This is like a departure from where we were before. And this also means that when you're early on in production, um, the farm, um, so you, you aren't paying to, for render capacity that you're not using yet, right? And then a, when there's a crunch, you are able to scale um, as, as quickly and uh, as much as you need depending on how much you screwed up with the planning. So now animation is a team sport, and it's not about one person um, being able to work, it's about multiple people being able to work together. So just as we have Carlos doing some design work, we may also want to have Anna to do some compositing. Uh, notice that her setup is, uh, it has more options than Carlos, is because she has more types of jobs that she can handle. So as a studio admin, I can create multiple environments and say, okay, this artist only gets one and this artist can do more jobs, so she gets more. And uh, these environments will have the pre-installed software and so on. And it is configured in the form of so-called launch profiles. So you say, okay, uh, it will have this template, uh, it will have access to such and such uh, studio components like render farms, storage volumes, license servers, etc. And uh, artists will be able to uh, pick between such and such sizes of an instance. So you also have these guard, uh, guardrails of who can launch um, different sizes of instances. So if you know that this group only needs to work with Photoshop, you probably will not give them like the uh, beefiest GPU-based uh, instance out there. And this is what it looks like for Anna. It's completely abstracted from her. So she can choose machine size, the template, uh, aka the launch temp, uh, the AMI, and 
uh, how to connect to it. She can use a browser or she can use a native client depending on whether she does feel like installing something on her machine or not. And uh, ultimately, the underlying complexity is abstracted and Anna can focus on work, collaborate with Carlos. Even when they're both using different OSs, they can have access to the same assets because it's all in the cloud and interoperable. And one additional perk of running a studio in the cloud is improved visibility. Um, you, when you create studio resources, you can assign tags. And these tags allow you then to pull up reports. How much resources were used for which tasks, uh, how much render capacity you were running on uh, throughout the project. This will like, give you visibility of how much you're spending and which tasks cost you most, for example. But also it will help you for the subsequent projects. You will have better visibility into the breakdown of your costs. Uh, before I hand it over to Chris again, uh, and I, I want to stress one point. Uh, placing your instances uh, close to where your artists are is important, I would say crucial. Currently, Nimble Studio is offered in four regions across US and uh, Canada. It's in London for Europe, and it's in Tokyo and Sydney for Asia Pacific. So expansion is planned, uh, but the current state of things is on the map. Um, now over to you, Chris. All right, um, so I'll get back into Pichu and how we use that uh, specifically with Blender. Um, we use Blender as our DCC backbone, uh, same way we'd use Maya or anything else. Um, we can use whatever applications are sort of best for the task at hand. So I, maybe I use ZBrush or I use Substance Painter or something else as an asset creator because that's what I'm familiar with as an artist or our contractors that we're bringing in. But it, ultimately it all feeds back into Blender. Um, we did some asset creation, we did all our rigging, our animation, uh, we made use of the new geometry nodes, um, and then we did all our lighting and rendering uh, in Blender with cycles. Uh, so I'll start off uh, with the bad news first, and then I'll get back to the good news so we can end on a happy note. Um, some of the stuff we liked, uh, or didn't like, was like some of the lighting. We thought we had some missing features. Um, a lack of light linking sort of hurt us. Um, creating a stylized film, like a, a good example is you want that very tight, specular highlight to hit right in the character's eyes in a very specific spot um, throughout most of the film. A good way to do that is to associate a light with a specific piece of geometry. Uh, we couldn't find um, a way to do that easily in Blender. So yeah, that part was difficult for us. Um, we also do a lot of things like you want to put specific rims on a face or things like that. So we used a lot of cards to kind of get around it. A lot of blocking cards, a lot of foliage that we turn off the primary visibility on. Things like that just sort of make up for that. Um, uh, another thing was uh, a lack of checkpointing. Um, so doing rendering in the cloud, uh, we could get a frame that's like a two hour long render frame. It gets about 95% of the way through. You're like, okay, great. Uh, I'm almost done. I can start compositing. And then the instance is taken away from you because <laughs> it's on spot. So somebody willing to pay more on demand, they take it from you. Um, with checkpointing, it would allow that frame to pick back up at 95%, um, but since Blender doesn't have that, it would start back over from zero. So, uh, so you lose a little bit of rendering time there um, and can be a little frustrating. Um, also for hair, uh, we moved that whole pipeline for the most part into Houdini, um, just for the simulation and grooming. Um, we found it much easier that the, the grooming tools in Blender weren't quite of what we needed them to be uh, for creating braids and um, the hair that we were doing in the film. Uh, and then. Staying with the simulation theme, uh, our clothing, uh, we move that into Maya and use InCloth. Uh, just because the, the Blender simulation, one, our artists weren't as familiar with it, and two, we couldn't really get the results that we wanted out of it in a short amount of time, so we quickly pivoted uh, over to other solutions. Now for the good stuff. Uh, the geometry nodes, they're awesome. Um, uh, we use custom nodes set up for scattering, uh, some of the stuff we pull off the marketplace uh, that really allowed us to very quickly populate the foliage and all the rocks and things throughout our sets. Um, the marketplace setups, we also used uh, our own custom geometry node setups, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, and then our animation, uh, one of the things that was pretty neat uh, is you could use uh, reference footage and the compositor uh, to very quickly put things together so the director can see what, what you're thinking uh, before you actually do the work, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. And uh, you can move forward, uh, more execution instead of kind of stumbling around and, and trying a bunch of things. Um, also, the pose library is pretty cool. So we could, uh, <laughs> yeah, 
Thank you. Uh, and uh, we can, uh, you know, use the same poses on multiple different characters because we're using the same rig for basically all the same characters. Um, so we can have a key artist come in, do all the very nice poses, and then hand that out to all our contractors to keep everything on model as most as best possible. Uh, and then lighting with cycles. Um, uh, full disclosure, like I've been lighting in Arnold from Soft Damage and Maya and things like that. Uh, working in cycles, I actually found really really nice. Um, the speed and stability uh, is oftentimes better in Arnold, in my experience, and working in Maya and things like that. Um, and the shader is, in my opinion, way better. Uh, Maya is pretty clunky and it has a lot of quirks that are just weird to work around. A lot of like, just tribal knowledge, how to make things go. Um, but Blender was very straightforward, easy to dive into, and I really enjoyed that part of it. Uh, so for our geometry nodes, um, our uh, effects artist Joaquin, he was able to create our own custom setup uh, for the snake grass that you can see in the film. Um, it's part of uh, this area that Mayu has to navigate through. But he was able to make it so that you could customize the size, the shape, uh, even the animation. So it had to blend to where, you know, when the grass is touching the ground, it's not bending so it doesn't feel like it's, it's wiggling through the ground. Uh, but then up at the top, it's wiggling quite a bit as it's hitting the wind and things like that. Uh, and then also the marketplace tools that we're able to download uh, to really speed up our production process. Uh, and then for animation, uh, I mentioned like using the compositor and the pose library. Um, it has a nice, easy to use interface uh, and really smoothed out that whole process, even because we had some animators who never animated in Blender before, but you, uh, get them in, get them working quickly, and uh, make the production nice and smooth. Uh, and here's a, a couple shots uh, working through that animation process, and you can see um, uh, Jason, uh, he filmed himself, composited himself in, uh, so he can act out the part of Mayu, and it's like, is this what you'd like her to do? Is this the way you think she'd react? And show her mom, like, oh, I'm coming home from school, like, check out what I did, mom. Um, <laughs> But that, you know, it's a very nice and quick way to get on the same page, make sure everybody's thinking the same thing, and then you can move forward to execution. So you can move forward into the blocking pass, um, make sure everyone's cool with that. And you get a bit more polish. But at this point, you know, everything's still kind of penetrating each other with the cloth, things like that. And then you add the hair and the cloth. Which this was a more complicated process. Um, if you want to know about it, you can talk to Jason later. But going back and forth between the mom touching the, uh, her daughter and her cloth, and uh, then the daughter touches her, and the back and forth between that has to happen with uh, cloth and animation uh, is pretty interesting. Um, but you can see the final results here. Uh, talk a bit about the lighting. Um, like I mentioned before, one of the things that was really nice was the speed. Uh, we rendered Pichu at 4K, and, and for the most part, it was about an hour per frame. Um, sometimes a little less, sometimes our heavier shots were closer to two hours. Um, but that's, uh, I think, pretty snappy overall, considering the size that we're rendering things at. Um, like I mentioned, the stability was great. Uh, we had a lot of very heavy scenes. You'll see a lot of foliage in there. Um, they actually opened comparatively quickly to the previous project we did in Maya, uh, where it would sometimes take 20 minutes to open the shot. Uh, our shots would open in like, you know, a couple minutes and you're ready to go. Um, very few crashes. I was able to, you know, start up the cycles render, um, move things around, scoot it around without restarting so I could kind of see it happening live. Uh, and that was a really great experience. I know um, in Maya, if you do that too much, you need to save a lot because you're probably going to crash it. Um, and then the shader editor, editor I mentioned, uh, it's easy, intuitive, uh, I found it very powerful and flexible, it's like Blender has all the little Lego blocks you need to kind of, if you know how you're doing it, just to make whatever you need happen. Um, like one example uh, is the refraction shader on the eyes, I was able to make it so that, uh, you know, normally you look at an eye straight on and it, you know, it looks fine, but you turn from the side and a lot of things it will, you just kind of look right through it. In a, in a stylized sort of film, uh, which is not what happens to a real eye. You actually see the curvature, it refracts the, the color and the shape of the eye through uh, at a side view. And I was able to do that in Blender. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, and then we also used the uh, shader editor to mix um, the physical sun and sky uh, with HDRIs uh, for our lighting. Uh, here's one of the, the lighting shots that you can see. Uh, you can see a lot of the cards that we used in the background as blockers. Um, 
all those trees like on the side there aren't actually rendered. They're just there to cast shadows uh, and block lights and, and really allow us to craft each shot as we wanted to. And then uh, we did our compositing in Nuke. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, we went into Nuke, and actually that pipeline was great. Because um, our, all our compositors, that's what we were comfortable with. That's what we knew. Uh, we needed to move fast. But the pipeline from going to Blender into Nuke was super easy. Uh, and it allowed our artists to use the tools that they knew and were comfortable with. And we did our final color in DaVinci. Um, just to get that last little touch of goodness, uh, make sure all the, the highlights are just right, uh, you're balancing all the colors with the character in the background, and uh, all those good things just to finish it off. And uh, at this point, I'll hand it back to Alexi briefly uh, to talk about uh, moving your production to Windows. Don't go far away, I need you. So um, I just wanted to uh, say a couple words about bottlenecks, and uh, I brought a picture of bottlenecks. Uh, so I have all the components. So uh, the list here is your typical bottlenecks that you run into when you're, when you're running your on-prem infrastructure at a studio. But these are also kind of a list of things that um, people talk about when they say why uh, you cannot do animation in the cloud or why you cannot work remotely. And uh, like you will find articles on the web explaining why exactly it's impossible. Uh, most of these articles are pretty old, so um, yeah. The laws of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's Murphy's Law? It's, uh, no, it's another one. It's Moore's Law, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have to get to know your laws. So, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it's progressing. So uh, uh, none of these things are a showstopper anymore. And uh, I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page about that. Uh, but uh, it's not only technical bottlenecks that held studios back from, from realizing um, uh, their, their big ideas. Uh, some of the bottlenecks are kind of non-technical nature, and I listed them here. And uh, curiously, or like interestingly enough, uh, cloud also helps solve those. So you have a bottleneck, for example, of location talent. So you don't, um, you 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 you're not limited to your local talent pool, but you can hire from everywhere. And uh, to the next bottleneck, time and money. They you can start small in the cloud and you can take it from there, get up and running in a, in a short time, and uh, yeah, you can deliver with a higher qual quality level with the resources that you have. Um, you're not limited to your, to your one workflow that your existing infrastructure is limiting you to. You can try out real-time workflow, you can try out creating for AR, VR, for multiple different platforms, and if something goes wrong, some experiments don't work out, you can just yeah, you can just turn it down, and uh, you're not you're not paying for it anymore. It's not standing there in your in your in your server room, um, accumulating uh, dust, so and depreciating in the process. And um, yeah, and also security. So for a very long time, securing your IP was the topmost. It's still topmost, but um, it's. Uh, in the cloud, it's, it's, it's doable with a set of tools that you have there, and many people, uh, many companies who move from on-prem to the cloud, they say the level of security they are able to achieve in the cloud is uh, at least on a level, uh, if not higher. And uh, today we talked about content production, uh, how it can be done in the cloud, but um, our focus with media entertainment doesn't stop there. Um, Internally, we divide it into different other uh, areas uh, apart from content production. Um, there is uh, media supply chain, there is broadcast, there is direct-to-consumer streaming, uh, read Netflix here, um, data science and analytics for media. These are different areas that we uh, internally at AWS divide media entertainment um, industry in, into. And in every of these sections, we offer managed solutions similar to what you see with Nimble Studio. It's an abstraction layer that makes it easier for you to stay creative and, and do things you want to do without having to worry about the underlying building blocks and orchestrating those. So I encourage you to check, check those out, and there will be a link on one of the subsequent slides. And uh, over to you, Chris, again, for the last time. All right. Thank you, Lyson. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to watch the short film Pichu, uh, it's on YouTube. Um, you can uh, hit the QR code here if you'd like to. Uh, please give it a look. Um, we think it's a, it's a nice looking film um, with a good message. Uh, it took us about nine months and 23, 25 artists uh, spread over six different countries. Um, and then part of our, our mission as Fuzzy Pixel is to consistently give back to the community. 
Um, so we've made uh, Mayu, the main character, uh, her notebook and a tree branch available on GitHub. Uh, so you're free to download the assets, uh, play around with her, um, use her in Blender, you know, do whatever your little heart desires. And then, um, you know, if you want to know more about Nimble Studio or other managed solutions uh, for media and entertainment, uh, you can check out uh, Nimble Studio in our m and &E stuff here. And if you have, have any questions, um, we'll be around, but we'll take a few now. Um, we have to pay for those licenses. Uh, we have our own license server uh, in the cloud, um, and then yeah, we just run it from there. As needed. Yeah. Okay. And do you have a distributed uh, simulation system for Houdini that can use send a simulation on multiple machines? Yes and no. Um, it was a little more manual. Um, we didn't have anything that was working like we could send it to the farm um, to do simulation type stuff. But what we could do uh, with Nimble is we could spin up multiple instances in the cloud. Uh, so our effects artists would uh, spin up like five or six machines uh, and then kind of hand distribute those to all the different machines there. Um, I was also, as a lighter, able to spin up two or three machines. And you know, um, you know, lighting kind of can take a while sometimes. So I'd, on one machine, get something going, just let it do so I can kind of see what it's going to look like in the end fire up another machine, get that going, uh, and it just allows us as artists to work much more efficiently. Okay, but you cannot combine multiple machines for one simulation? Um, the way we had it, no, currently, yeah. I, I imagine if you know what you're doing, though, you can make that work. Uh, yeah? Yes. So a question about the Nimble Studio set up for workstations. Is there any standard component in Nimble Studio for the collaborative side? Um, for us, we were using uh, Slack a lot. Um, we also use SyncSketch, I think you'll see, uh, for all our reviews. Uh, so we use uh, like a Zoom or a Chime call, and we all get on that, and then we can use SyncSketch to talk, but directly built into Nimble. Um, no, not currently. Uh, we did have the uh, shared storage and everything just so we can you know, share all the same files and be looking at the same things. But as far as collaboration tools, we went a little bit outside of Nimble for that. Uh, yeah, over here. How did you manage assets and did version publishing? Uh, we did that through Kitsu. Um, as a, I believe that's another open source thing. Uh, we had our engineers uh, hook that up and write into stuff for Blender. Um, and then we used a system where we were uh, versioning as we went along. So we have all our versions of files. Uh, so we, you know, if we need to roll back, they're always there. But then we also had a, an unversioned file, uh, which is what we're using to link or reference into our Blender scenes. Um, that way, you can open it up, and you can always have whatever the latest uh, approved file is. Yeah. Uh, at this point, um, I don't know, with GPUs getting cheaper, that's a, a bigger debate, I think. Um, the nice thing, is, like Alessi mentioned, is that you can get rid of that GPU if you're not using it. Um, so you're kind of only paying what you're using for at the moment, uh, which can lower your costs a bit. Uh, but if you're using that thing 24-7, maybe uh, you know, a different conversation to have. Well, probably if, you, if you're going to sell it later, uh, you need to understand like, how much it will, uh, how much value it will, it will lose until then. Uh, so we'll be able to buy a new one as, as like the better version, the whatever current uh, best thing is. With that same money, probably not. So it's, uh, yeah, this kind of conversation. There are many other aspects that uh, we can talk about, like not necessarily about the cost, but yeah. How do you convince them? <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and I tell them, so let's buy a cloud solution. He's like, no, let's just buy another That's why. Uh, IP security is another point. Um, for example, with remote access that we uh, used uh, using NiceDCV, it's just pixel streaming. You're not downloading any assets on your local machine. 
So basically, assets don't leave wherever they're supposed to be. And this is another plus. So you don't have copies of your assets on everybody's machines in their homes. Are you EPN approved? Are we what? EPN approved. Are we? It's usually a conversation because there's a shared security model. So usually you end up having a conversation with them and then they go through and analyze what you've set up. Okay. Uh, but we have to go through pretty crazy security in order to be able to actually get the whole studio out there. So mm -hmm. uh, the best thing to do is you know, get together with uh, your solutions architects and sort of run through your system with them to make sure everything is all Okay. Yeah, I mentioned that Nimble Studio was revamped uh, to make it well architected, mm -hmm. and one of the so-called pillars of the well-architected framework is security. So we made sure it uh, it's up to the to the standards of how you make things to secure in the cloud. But when it comes to being uh, compliant with a certain standard, we need to go through the points and just tick the boxes and see together what we can do. Because Hollywood is really picky about uh, the security stuff. Oh yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Oh, we use the Limbic. Yeah. Um, I think for the most part, the Limbic worked pretty well. Um, one of the things I found was that I wasn't able to modify the Limbic afterwards to do like shot sculpting. Um, so I tried to use geometry nodes for that at first, um, but I'm not the best at geo nodes yet. Uh, so I couldn't make that work, and I defaulted back to Maya because you know then you can mod modify that and then pump that back in. Yeah, yeah. So you know if if you can modify the Olympic in Blender, I would have just done it there, but I just couldn't figure out how to do it, you know, under the time constraints. Yeah, we didn't use USD on this one, but yeah, there's got to be ways to do that that shot sculpting work there at the end just to make everything look. Just one right. last question. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> they're cutting us on time. Okay. I was wondering uh, how big of a problem was it that during rendering, uh, higher paying customers can essentially steal your instance? And was it a huge problem during production? Uh, it was, no, it was not a huge problem. Um, one of the ways we worked around that is you can sort of diversify the types of instances you're getting. Um, so it's like, oh, maybe we get a slightly slower render, but we know that you know, customers aren't constantly pulling that type of instance. Um, so we were able to get our renders through that way. We were able to scale pretty well. Um, I think it was sort of just an issue at first uh, till we recognized the problem. Uh, and then we sort of found work ways or workarounds to get to you know, reliable renders. Um, and then we also found that a lot of those on-demand type instances are pulled during working hours. Um, and then so like five o'clock hits and then everything comes back and you can get like a, you know, a massive amount of capacity at that point and really shove everything through. Cool, but uh, I think we're out of time at this point. Yeah. So uh, thanks everybody for showing up. <laughs>